man of steel and presents a certain breakthrough at the same time it presents some problems. Uh, I think all of you would probably agree in some way that Indo-Europeans had a concept of sacred heat, uh, tempos, uh, one might call it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll let you get this I have someone desperately wants a recording of me out of a bar. You can go and I'll get going. All right, good. Yeah. All right. I got um, and the re reconstructions usually with the E and the O, and uh, it pops up in Sanskrit as tapas, uh, and Latin as tepidus, tepere, from which we have borrowed tepid in English, um, like most of the coffee one gets here. Okay. Uh, um, there's clearly a physiological sort of intuition about what's going on with passion and, and rage and whatnot. Uh, and this is, seems to be some kind of primitive idea uh, with uh, linking uh, the physiological sense <coughs> being hot to magical power of some sort. But perhaps uh, obviously related to fire, but perhaps also to lightning. Uh, and this is what the Indian ascetic is supposed to uh, uh, build up by his austerities. It's maybe something that's lurking inside Indra's Vajra, uh, since the root for the lightning bolt here is the same word as Vigari, to grow, vegetative growth in Latin. Uh, or English wick, dialect word wick, and perhaps quick if you fit around with other originals enough. Augustus would be the uh, man with the most vegetative power. It doesn't mean anything about being August as we understand that term. Uh, There's a lovely piece from Slavic, the Ilya Muromets hero sits on a stove for 30 years. And uh, the bards, of course, a very late attestation, the bards interpret this as uh, evidence of his being a lazy, good for nothing teenager type uh, in prolonged adolescence. But it's a really, I would say, reinterpretation of an earlier uh, image or earlier bardic tradition in which the hero is actually extracting heat from that stove uh, and building up uh, his power for heroic deeds. There's some evidence from Celtic, Lud turns red hot uh, with anger, a national physiological response again, denouncing the murderers of his father, Kjan. Kulkulan, the frenzied one of Eru, as he's called in one of the tales, is in a heated frenzy uh, when he returns from his first exploits and has to be dunked cool off. Uh, and Germanic is a little less, it's very, very ten tenuous, and we'll come back to this. Uh, Sigurd, in the Volsunga saga, bathes in the scalding hot blood of the dragon Fafnir that he's just uh, killed. Uh, usually this condition can't last, it has to be removed, it's dangerous, and it's done by dunking in certain cases, and we'll come back to this again. And Celtic Kukulin, when he comes back from his raids, is dumped in three vats of water uh, and is rendered uh, first stunned by the vision of 50 naked women. Uh, <laughs> and then they grab him and dump him in the water. <laughs> uh, the Armenian hero Mahar, uh, actually, there's no vowel I'm told. I, I do know a bit of Armenian. It's M H R, but stress is uh, between the H and the R, so they often concede to our orthographic needs by putting an E in there. Uh, Mahar. He has to be dumped in seven bags, I believe it is. It's, this is a piece by Dumas Zeal somewhere. Um, and then there is, uh, from my own work with the uh, Nart material, there's this Rokla, and uh, he has to be dunked or quenched in water. Okay. Now, there's some other stuff that's a little unsettling. These are these roasted infants uh, that pop up in Greek uh, and in Phrygian, Achilles, or Achilles. He's roasted by his mother, the goddess, or Titanus Tetis. She tries, she tries to roast the mortality out of him. This is the interpretation of the process. Uh, and of course, Peleus, her mortal husband, is horrified. Oh my God, you're burning our baby. And it's, in, it's interrupted. She says, okay, I'll cool him off. I'll dunk him in this river here. And uh, holds him by his heel. Okay. Uh, Demeter, wandering to try to find Persephone, is offered uh, uh, res uh, uh, shelter by a family. And in the night, she sneaks in, grabs the baby boy, Dingo Poan, and starts roasting the mortality out of him. She's trying to do him a favor. Hey, I'll make him into a god. Come on. And mommy gets up and says, oh my god, what are you doing? You're burying our baby. Okay. Probably tied in with the old changeling idea. You throw your kid in the fire, you know, it's colicky, it could get away. Okay. And Isis, you know, we're going to another tradition all together. Isis, meaning throne in Egyptian, roasts baby Horus. We're talking. Okay. Now, there's a set of very peculiar tales, mostly exemplified in the Caucasus, but apparently also, according to the late Vladislav Arzimba, uh, who was a linguist and mythologist before he became leader of Abkhazia, um, 
And there's also a lot of this material in Kit Tide. He's a Hittipologist before he became a politician and a, and a rebel. Um, and this is a baby born from a stone. It was, as I say, now tested more squarely in an art saga. So the particularly Circassian ones, not the Ossetian ones, insofar as I've been able to find any. Uh, Satanaya, whose name is literally Mother of a Hundred, uh, she's bathing uh, in, uh, and becomes the object of lust uh, to a shepherd's sauce. And um, there are strong parallels here, of course, with Aphrodite and Achaeses. And Sos uh, is very excited, but he ends up ejaculating before he can reach her, and his sperm lands on a rock. Okay. And the rock becomes pregnant, hot, and eventually the god of the forge, whose name in Circassian is Klepsh, and in um, Abkhazian, Einar, which is an interesting name. Uh, these are the only characters that are consistently identified as gods in the tradition. Uh, uh, this smith god comes along, cracks open the stone, and extracts a flaming baby uh, from this uh, and quenches the baby in water. This renders the baby dark, okay, um, and hard skinned, invulnerable, uh, except where he has been held by tongs. And in this case, it's not the heel, it's at his knees or thighs, okay. Uh, he's very powerful, he hangs out at the smith's uh, uh, abode, at the smithy and has his childhood basically there. And at one point he shows, in, er, as silver heroes often do, uh, always do really, uh, shows his enormous power and strength by lifting out this anvil of the smith god from Earth's seven layers and plunging it back in to nine layers. Uh, speaking of Dante and all that. Um, and this smith's anvil is called in, Ab uh, in uh, Abkhazian, uh, or Abaza actually, Abrahel. Uh, which is literally heaven stone, upper heaven and hell stone. Um, and for this, he is awarded with a magic drink, the sound of the gods, and uh, he doesn't hog it, he, he pours it out from the clouds and down upon humanity it comes. So he also brings water, brings fire, and things like that. Uh, he does a whole bunch of things. Now, there's a book out there by a fellow named Hunt, who's extracted some of this stuff from my own work, and he got it wrong. <laughs> he says that the Iron Man, the, the Hard Man, the, the Quenched Man, is imp impotent and can't do anything. No, 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 don't do that. This guy's a major seducer, okay? So, <laughs> Hunt got it wrong, just I wanna make that point here. Um, so he grows up at the smithy, and uh, he's, he plays there, and we have a very striking parallel in this with the Irish Poulan's town, Poulan. Okay, he uh, grows up at the smithy, must take on the guard dogs, uh, Poulan's the guard dogs, uh, do these because he's killed. Now, there is a vulnerability in all this. Grief, of course, is Achilles' heel, where Thetis held, Thetis held him. Um, and interestingly enough, and, and Dr. Lin has pointed this out to me, that as long as Achilles is alive and, and basically invulnerable, the Greeks cannot be defeated. Uh, and when he's killed, eventually by an arrow in his heel, of course, uh, he, uh, the Greeks become more vulnerable in some sense. So <coughs> I'm interpreting this almost as though this, this is kind of deity-like deity -like quality, the hero is imparting his power to the entire, <laughs> entire group that he leads. Uh, in Germanic, uh, Sigurd had a leaf fall on his back when he was bathing in the blood, and that one little spot remains vulnerable. Of course, when they throw the spear at him, it kills him, it will hit right there in that vulnerable spot and die. So Shruko is eventually killed or, or rendered impotent, in this case, and maybe where Hunt got it wrong. Uh, he's buried alive and becomes a roaring stream under a mountain. But he's hit with a discus in his thighs and it cuts off his legs. Yeah, so that sort of thing. Okay. Now, I didn't know what to make of this, and neither did uh, uh, Dr. Arzenba, Khalid Arzenba, uh, but Will figured it out. <laughs> Dr. Lin figured it out. He said, this is a transparent, this is looking you right in the face. There's nothing strange about this. This is a tra transparent instance. We're going to short it out. Now. Quenching the steel here. Uh, yes, quenching, <laughs> quenching the heat. Uh, this is a transparent mimesis of the birth of iron technology about 3,000 years ago, 3,200 maybe, something like that. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a relic of the, of the advent of the Iron Age, or the Steel Age, I think. Um, the best attestation of this is the latest, oddly enough, the NARC material, but things in the Caucasus never seem to change, it gets stuck somehow. Uh, the head and stone represent an iron nickel meteorite, which is generally found half buried, if it's found at all, 
Uh, and this would be the earliest major source, large bulk bit of, of steel that you could have, something resembling steel, an alloy. And it's extracted through intense heat, which would involve <coughs> a advent in technology with the smithy of bellows and charcoal use, extensive charcoal use, more than would be done in the uh, uh, alloying of copper and tin or bronze. Okay. It also involves impurity. The best metal, iron is good, but it's not particularly strong. It's fragile, it's friable, they call it in metallurgy. It breaks easily. And if you have a wrought iron piece of fencing or something, you, you, can, you can break it with a hammer, it's no problem. Um, so it has to have a certain amount of carbon, between 3% 5% carbon, and maybe some nickel too, to keep it from rusting. And uh, you get this beautiful mess, and the mess is much more useful than anything pure that you've come up with. Okay? Uh, so there's going to be some kind of, of, of intellectual implication in this as well as martial implications and political implications. It has to be tempered, it has to be rendered hard in the various degrees of heating and, and immersion and whatnot like this to, to strengthen it. It makes it dark, generally speaking. There are scales of darkness that you can, you can download from the web and I'll tell you how, how things have been uh, uh, quenched. There's always going to be a spot, however, that's not quenched because you got to hold it somehow, okay? Although there are now modern technologies where they sort of blast cold gases and, and, and high pressure liquids over things kind of float them. Um, it's dark, like Sosruko and Kuchelen, and um, uh, uh, there is even a tale of Batraz who gets hot at the end of his life, becomes red hot, on a pyre with bellows blowing away like that, sort of like a kind of a recycling kind of mix. And this would be a valuable uh, material. And one even says in one tale here, it's very interesting, I'll read you the Abaza. Okay. I couldn't believe it when I saw this. Well, it's a baza, it's hard to believe anyway. The steel, my, he says, my blood is steel. Ah, jur. Jur is steel. Shat is blood. Shat is my blood. Ajorta, steel -y. It has a word sitting on the front of his eye. Alag cha. Cha is to put in, throw in to something. It's literally the word for alloy. He says, I am, my blood is steel, I am steel alloy. And then he has some, some very strange things as well that I, I might point to. Steel is my blood, I am steel alloy. And then I, I cite the rest of it. And there's, there's, it, says, it says here, now the magic you put into this, you know, wh what's, going, what's going to happen? It, it has come back to haunt you. The power of steel that you have made has come back to haunt you. It's reflected back onto you. And uh, this is uh, perhaps part of the problem of the technological breakthrough. This caused military ships, military changes, people with iron and steel armor to go out now and beat the living poop out of guys that were dressed in bronze. They had a whole thing on the battlefield. No matter how brave they were, how many there were, they could be slaughtered like lambs. So this must have been a tremendous social and political uh, shift in the ancient world. And we can date it to around the time of the Trojan War. It seems to be something around this with Achilles and all that. Now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Lin, and uh, PowerPoint to work. It's always as reliable as we know. Uh, I got it. Let's see. And slideshow presenter view. Anybody from presenter view? This is from beginning. From beginning, no, it'll do it. it. Oh, that's not presenter view. Yeah, I have some kind of goofy thing. Do we have presenter view available? Fine. We'll make it work. Okay. So, um, First, I want to say thank you to John, who's been a tremendous mentor, collaborator, and, and friend uh, and supporter since we uh, first connected, since I first used the excuse of a conversation I had with, uh, oh, let's see here, <laughs> since the <laughs> conversation I had with uh, the Ed Meyer who uh, wrote and produced uh, RoboCop. <coughs> so, <coughs> John. So, uh, coming back to the Nard sagas, it barely takes a read to see the Sosruko, Soslan, and Petraz are poetically related to steel. They're even called steel, repeatedly. It's appeared in a slide of Paolo's, actually, earlier this weekend. What they are is no secret in the stories. Uh, what's stunning is the coherence, consistency, and completeness with which this complex of steel-based motifs has, been, has found expression. <coughs> From the initial emergence and industrialization of steel, all the way into the more recent industrial and nuclear revolutions. But though I'll spend some time demonstrating the consistencies, which is where we started, 
They're so obvious, it kind of feels like beating a dead horse. Uh, and as exciting as it is to start seeing through this cluster of motifs, which John started with, uh, from characters like Achilles to Kukulin to Iron Man and the Man of Steel, our more interesting conversations have actually been about the ancient and ongoing relationship of new technologies with mythic and philosophical outlooks, which seem to have been severe during the Iron Age transition. So in a moment, in a moment I'll cruise through the basic steel making process quickly and, and uh, the trans this is some of what we've already done, uh, transparent transposition into the technological process, uh, into mythological motifs. We'll look at contemporary expressions of the motif complex, uh, we'll reveal, which reveal a crucial single <coughs> update that we're really interested in. Uh, and this will demonstrate an ongoing relationship of what we're calling technopoiesis uh, and its importance to mythic formations. Uh, before getting there, though, I want to talk about Tolkien's notion of mythopoiesis. A tree is not just a tree, he so famously told C.S. Lewis. But where Tolkien was especially engaged in a poetic relationship with nature, we've become extremely interested in a poetic relationship with technology. Not to say Tolkien wasn't, but this is a focus of ours. Which, unlike nature, technology progresses quickly and by human hands. To convey the emphasis we're trying to make, we're using this term technopoiesis to describe a poetic relationship with technology. Uh, and among uh, the special features of technopoiesis, we found a few. One, a fixation on the human capacity to make great change, even in competition with nature or the divine. Two, a poetic progression of imagery and, and motifs that mime the progress of technology, which is in stark contrast with the mythopoetic products of nature. And three, the way new technologies and their poetic expressions can absolutely challenge the belief systems of their day, which we're finding in the Copernican level revolution between the Bronze and Iron Age. To be more specific, we've come to suspect that the discovery of metal that became more impervious and immortal when corrupted with charcoal challenged an older emphasis on purity, uh, as John mentioned, that's relatively consistent with good clay, gold, silver, and bronze. So our sense is that while steel as a substance transformed the world, steel as a mythopoetic foundation transformed our worldviews. Where the physical transition from bronze to Iron Age coincided with sea people raids, the Trojan War, slave uprisings, the first record, record of a Hebrew, Dorian invasions, and explosion, uh, the explosion of Phoenician dominance, it seems that the philosophical effect of steelwork was contingent with a set of values that gave new appreciation to fallen and corrupt heroes, even those who, like Achilles and Bethraz, attacked the gods directly. It may even be that the structure of anti-heroes co-emerged through personifications of iron corrupted into steel. Betras, for example, is dark if not evil, though a savior. And Achilles, who sacrilegiously drags Hector by the heels, is also an anti-hero. So where the corruption of Adam and Eve, or a golden age men, were seen as falls, steel figures are seen as corrupt, dark, and magnificent heroes. Uh, so where they seem to all be giving, in, giving way to what Rudyard Kipling famously wrote, iron. Cold iron is ruler of them all. By the way, we see this tension in the work of Plato, uh, who prioritized aesthetic purification and loathed Homer's corrupt heroes. The mimesis of Steele's introduction to the ancient world and the prioritization of technology and human desires over purity or the divine, even at the expense of such corruption and sacrilege as represented by the Trojan horse or the philosophical emergence of Protagoras' sophistry and even the corrupted egoism of Thrasymachus. So, uh, so now we should shift over into uh, some of these basics, and this is what we already have gone through. I don't want to repeat too much. Uh, there are more motifs uh, based on steel than, than we've even identified, more than we can put here. Uh, this presentation is not a nutshell of our work. It's barely the trunk of our elephant. Uh, we're very excited <laughs> by all the work we have to do. Okay, excellent, thank you. So, um, Basically, we start with meteorite falling from the sky, iron were extracted from the stone meteorite, iron heated in fire with charcoal to turn it into steel, red hot steel plunged in water, held by tongs, steam fills the air next cloud, steel is hard, goes from red hot to bluish, except the weak spot, as John described, where it was held. And I don't want to repeat this too much, I think uh, John did a good bit of it, and, and, uh, but there are more examples than we can really even discuss of how uh, the, the Narn heroes really represent each of these motifs, especially or specifically those who are described as, as steel. Uh, so, how, like the steel Narcs, Iron Age Achilles, as mentioned, was roasted in fire, dipped in water, described as steel by Hector, literally. Uh, his strength is steel, he says, when he says if he has to fight him, even though his strength is steel, he'll do so. Brave man. Um, 
And uh, so it's worth noting, though, also, that his armor came from the heavens, and that the Trojan War occurred smack dab in the middle of the Bronze Age collapse and the emergence of iron on an industrial scale. The way it seems is that Achilles, the greatest warrior weapon on the battlefield, represented the presence of steel, which would have been to the Trojan War what the machine gun was to World War I or the atom bomb to World War II, establishing a new foundation uh, for human culture uh, and warfare. As you can imagine, as stunned as we were by the anchoring motifs of metal bodies and single weaknesses, we didn't exactly expect to find more, uh, more than a few of these motifs later. Um, however, uh, <laughs> we were stunned by how, uh, how consistent and full uh, this set has been found, or we can find in, uh, in, in new characters. And by the way, they're even uncanny things. You saw the metal baby? You know? Like, it uncanny, right? So, um, <clears throat> let's, let's uh, oh, by the way, one of the, the elephant leg we won't get to today are some of the uh, uh, Neolithic motifs uh, in which these metallurgical and later uh, steel-based motifs are nesting. So, let's look at some specifics. Uh, Wolverine's bones made of meteorite adamantium, Iron Man falls from the sky, uh, and, and his big becoming creates a crater filled with metal, steel, and iron. Superman craters into the earth in meteorite uh, spaceship. I, um, Wolverine's adamantium is extracted from a meteorite. Iron Man's heart's made of palladium, which comes with the iron nickel uh, meteorites, uh, and it's extracted from a missile. Uh, and Superman is found in a meteor-shaped uh, crater. Uh, Wolverine's filled with molten metal, Iron Man is born from fire, uh, and uh, Superman's starship, uh, how did I want to say that? Superman came from the heavens like a meteor, uh, oh, no. Superman is created, uh, ex extracted from the crater of his meteor-like starship. Oops, lost myself. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, you see how uncanny this is? Literally, this is the opening sequence. He comes in, comes in from the sky. The next thing you see, he's on a flaming barge of steel. He's on fire, literally. His back, he's on fire, and then he plunges right into the water. I can't believe that this is accidental. I would love to say maybe it's collective unconscious repetition of archetypal patterns. I do come from a school like that. However, my sense is that, uh, my sense is that great storytellers that are writing about characters associated with steel, personifying steel, are going to look into the processes and find inspiration in their narratives. Well, we think, we're thinking uh, along the lines of something like a generative mythology in which there's a kind of fundamental logic. There isn't a, an inventory of motifs, really, as it's traditionally seen, but these things are reshaped and come out in similar fashion because of a kind of logic that confronts a similar uh, association, a similar transition, and the, the fundamental chaos that underlies such processes. Uh, so the vulnerability now is no longer soft spot, it's vulnerability to the modern threat, radiation. This is our smoking gun. Kryptonite. And, and this is how we're showing that it's not just a repetition of the motif, but actually a recurring techno, techno poetic <coughs> relationship with technology. So we see yeah. that we've updated it based on the new situation with the same style of poesis. The two guys that invented Superman, Shulman, Shulman and, and Siegel, did so in 19, over a period of three years, in 1936, 1939, something like that. They, they, as far as we know, they didn't read any art sagas. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they probably didn't know much about uh, Achilles or Kufalan. Uh, but somehow they came out, Superman's blue, for God's sake. Yeah, Superman's blue and red. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, it's it's explicit. Right. So, so uh, this, makes, this makes comparative effort actually very tricky. Because now we have to <coughs> think what really is a detail, what really is inherited. Can these details, even down to the very fine peculiarities, reemerge? Spontaneously, some kind of a generative capacity, creating myth. No, I think that's uh, we, we can turn to questions. I think that's basically uh, where we've landed today. So we, we, have, we have four minutes, Louise. Yes. Um, Yakut shaman initiation rituals where the candidate is filled with molten, molten metal. His bones are taken out and replaced by iron. Right, adamant, adamant even, just like Wolverine. Yeah. And uh, the cool. cloak that he wears, uh, I've always wondered about the, the presence, the importance of metal in these initiatory uh, myths hmm. uh, gives you a, a, a dating, a stratum in a way mm -hmm. for shamanism, which mm -hmm. has got to therefore be Iron Age. And the, the cloaks and things are sewn with bits of metal. Hmm. It's as if the whole skeleton is turned 
A new body. A new, a new body, body. And then right. it worn externally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the death, rebirth, and the rebirth is in a new and immortal and eternal form, yep. much like these heroes. They go through, of course, you saw uh, Wolverine, <coughs> like, he basically dies on the table. And they're like, oh, we failed. Yeah. Beep, beep, <laughs> beep. Well, I mean, there's, there's this, uh, just, there's the uh, recycling of older themes, so the older tough boss material is reworked and reused uh, for new information, a new formation, and that is the iron, iron hero. And now we're looking at yet a similar reworking, but where do they get these ideas? And where, where do they, do they go back to the old stuff to, to rework it? Because you probably didn't know about it. So we're beginning to wonder where in the, uh, is the old stuff really old stuff, or is it just something recreated by this myth capacity? Mm -hmm. I, I think there's something, something very, very, very different, something very odd about metaworking anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> metaworking anyway is a, a new mythic strata. Like you are completely right. Because the idea is that uh, Eliad makes this argument, which I think is correct, that, that you have to cook the body of the mother. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that you've got to extract mm -hmm. something from the, from the body. And actually, uh, if you remember the ejaculation scene, yeah. there's a surrogate mother. It uh, is the stone itself that has to be cooked and heated. Yeah, that's right. We, we have one more. Oh, two more. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay. go ahead first. Uh, just parenthesis. In Romanian folklore, the heroine has to wear um, iron shoes in order to find her lost husband. Oh. And until she uh, exhausts them completely, she can find him. Which is an interesting aspect. It's not a male, it's yeah. a female that wears shoes of iron. Right. One thing, another thing I was wondering if you could uh, uh, touch on the uh, gold industry in fashion. That the was gold, you say? Gold. In fashion. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. in Greece. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah gold industry that was met, uh, a type of metallurgy mm -hmm. and it, it's evidently a soft metal mm -hmm. and it gave the uh, connotation of gold and uh, light and iron is dark so I think it would be an interesting connotation there to see because I think the, uh, this uh, marks the difference between a, a period of mythology and the second time exactly. of mythology yeah. Gold was for the mistress, silver for the maid, copper for the craftsman, cunning at his trade. We, yes, we, have, we have two more papers to go, so let's right. make it there. Thank you. Horse? You're up. My paper now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Unless Nick wants to go first. Do you want to go first, Nick? That line? No, you. Stick to the program boards. <laughs> My paper is very short. I have no PowerPoint and nothing to talk. I'll give you some lights then. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so, um, I begin with saying that I was uh, wondering whether the uh, comparison of bees and the cows in, in Vedic and Celtic was quite accidental, something casual, or uh, whether it is deeply rooted in... Thank <laughs> you.